Hello, my name's Russell, and I'm here to talk about a book. It's a book by James Joyce called Ulysses, which you've probably heard of. You may be uh, intrigued by it. You may be a little daunted by it, but it's quite a good time to get involved with it because February 22, which is not far off, will be the 100th anniversary of its, uh, of its first publication. So, um, yeah, now I have got to know it pretty well. And I recently presented a series of lectures on it. Uh, the, and, I, and I've now put those together and there's a book coming out, which is effectively those lectures. And, I, and, and what I thought I'd do would be to present um, the first lecture here as a, uh, a sort of a teaser for the book. And this is the introductory lecture that I gave uh, back in September 2020, and it was the introduction to the course. It begins, stately, plump Buck Mulligan came from the stairhead, bearing a bowl of lava on which a mirror and a razor lay crossed, unquote. I'm intrigued by the first line of novels. That's that first line. How the author must in that instant draw the reader in and not let go. Here, we are intrigued, but we also learn so much from so little. A man is about to have a shave. Why would he need to be stately? Who's stately for a shave? Now, as the very first word, it must be an emphatic characteristic. And so it suggests, well, to me at least, some sort of performance, uh, an act, and that implies an audience. The bowl and the laid crossed utensils, well, they hint of the chalice used in a Catholic mass. And indeed that is confirmed because we get this character's first words, in troibo ad altari dei. And that's the opening words of the mass, uh, the Latin meaning, I go unto the altar of God. So from these few words, what do we glean? We have a man, we know his name, and that he's plump, so we have a visual. Presumably, he doesn't go short of food. Now, he's coming from the stairhead up onto what will be a roof. So we have a visual of a man ascending as though approaching an altar. And what do we think? What I think, right, the impression I get is that he's some sort of mimic, a joker a showman and a blasphemer, for this is 1904 Ireland, rigidly Catholic, yet he reduces the sacred act of the mass to his morning shave. His audience will be confirmed in the next few lines, but from these initial words, we have identified correctly, as it turns out, the character of Buck Mulligan. And we are entitled, even at this embryonic stage in the book, to make a far from hazardous guess that the book before us will be comical, a little base. It will deal with big issues and be symbolic by virtue of linking matters of mythical magnitude to supposedly innocuous everyday acts. Such is James Joyce and his amazing economy. Every word precisely right. Welcome to this series of lectures entitled An Understanding of Ulysses. My name is Russell Raphael, and I'll do my best to guide you through what might be considered a challenging novel. A suitable uh, epithet might have been um, uh, normal Joyce for normal people, because I don't intend this to be at the PhD geeky level. There's enough of that out there, and it's fantastic uh, if that's your thing, but it's not this thing. But nor will this be an idiot's guide, for there are certain issues that if we don't do sufficient justice, we'll just miss too much. It's a book with a reputation stigma even. Accusations abound of 
difficulty, vulgarity and obscenity, often by those that have not read it. Now, difficulty, yes, some parts are challenging. So what? Not everything in life is easy. If you want a superficial page turner, there's enough of those out there. Vulgar, yes, it's real life, so it gets down and dirty, but also it scales the heights. Obscene, well, not in the sense of what we're used to these days, it's not going to titillate, but even a hundred years on, it's capable of shocking, which I'd say is a good thing. So yes, there are passages, passages that might raise pulses a little and all the better for that. Now, in this introduction, I intend to cover five main areas. One, some general background. Uh, two, the link to Homer's The Odyssey. Three, a little on uh, style, structure and content. Uh, four, I'll take a couple of the main themes and explain those in a little more detail. And lastly, fifthly, and lastly, um, I'll do a little intro on our three main characters. So let's start the first of those with a little general background. Ulysses was published on Joyce's 40th birthday, 2nd February 1922. And that would have pleased him because he was a big believer in coincidences and uh, sort of serendipity. At that point, he previously published some other works, and I'm, I'm just focusing on the prose ones here. So those were uh, Dubliners, which was a collection of short stories, and that was published in 1914. And then a semi-autobiographical novel um, called A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, which was published in 1916. So we are now, as I say, with Ulysses, 1922, and then afterwards his final uh, prose book, uh, Finnegan's Wake, and that would uh, have to wait until 1939. It took him an awful long time to write that. Right, Ulysses. It's been banned, it's been burned and trashed and loved, and in pretty much equal measure. It's a bloody great something of a novel. What that something is, I, I couldn't say, for it so brims over with laughter and pathos and song and dance and flesh and blood and pain and joy, blasphemy and reverence, envy and generosity, body and oh so complex mind, no and yes, death and life. It divides category. All life is within. It's cram packed with life, more life than you could shake a stick at, or more appropriately, an ash plant. You might want to look that up. A novel in which to get lost, drowned, journey, no matter how far, one never quite arrives because there's always a secret garden down an undiscovered lane. To approach it as a challenge is fruitless because it can't be conquered. If the search for secrets is the compulsive aim, the joy of the ride will be missed. Just let it ooze over you and get what you get. Next time, there'll be more. Don't lose the phosphorescence of the prose in the search for pearls way beneath. Rejoice in the language celebrate the ordinary. A day in a life, a life in a day. Now, these lectures are primarily directed towards those new to the book or who have previously struggled with it, which let's face it, catches pretty much everyone. Now, I'm no academic. I'm simply someone that read, enjoyed, read some more, and was inspired to delve deeper and get under the skin of the thing. I shall, try, I shall try to provide a taster per chapter to enable you to then read the corresponding episode with some confidence and finish it satisfied 
that you understood its essence and even several of the nuances. Of course, technically, there are no episodes or chapters, but don't worry, we'll get to that. I really doubt I shall say anything original because there cannot be any aspect of this book that has not in these 99 years been stripped bare and had investigative tubes plunged into every orifice for some book or thesis. I will though try and give a lively and even occasionally jocular overview so that you may know your Sandy Mount from your Glasnevin, your Parnell from Griffiths, Scepter from Throwaway, and the Ormond Hotel from Barney Kiernan's. You may even venture some thoughts on the man in the Macintosh. Now, part two of this introduction is the link with Homer. One will hear that the book is a retelling of Homer's Odyssey, the Odyssey. Well, the title is the Latin name for Odysseus, hero of the Odyssey, so there's a clue. But were it not for that, one may be forgiven for missing any link between it and Joyce's Ulysses. After all, what could Leopold Bloom, a middle-aged cuckolded Dubliner of Hungarian Jewish descent, an advertising salesman by trade and pacifist by nature, have in common with Odysseus, the warrior king from Ithaca. He of many turns and adventures, usually involving bloody battles and sexual conquests, one survives countless shipwrecks, the other loses control of a rowing boat. One story spans a familiar absence of 20 years. In the other, hubby pops out, completes some errands, comes home. For this book is set on a single day in Dublin, 16th of June, 1904. And yet, Joyce intended Leopold Bloom to be his Ulysses, reincarnated, intact, if not intact, then in essence. Just as he cast Bloom's wife, the adulterous Molly, as the faithful Penelope, and Stephen Dedalus as Telemachus, son of Odysseus and Penelope. Well, not only are Bloom and Molly not Stephen's parents, Stephen's mother has recently died and his father Simon appears throughout the novel alive and very much kicking, but Stephen and Bloom barely know each other. So what's going on? Well, it's analogous, um, and analogy does not always walk straight. In this book, it does a bit of a jig, staggers about, and spills its beer. If it's analogous, well then to what? Well, that we shall revisit as we go along. Now, let's not get too hung up on the Odyssey. A phrase one reads is that the book is strung across the loom of the epic, that it's its jumping off point, but not really any more than that. And that seems to me to strike the right note, as well as chiming with a nice Odyssean theme of weaving. I'll refer to uh, the Odyssey as necessary. For now, suffice to say, Homer's classic is an epic story of usurpation and revenge with lots of adventure, bloody and sexual along the way. While Odysseus is struggling to return from the Trojan Wars, his home is invaded by potential suitors uh, for the hand of his wife, Queen Penelope, who against all the odds maintains dignity and fidelity. Odysseus eventually returns and kills them all. And that's it. That's all we need to know for now. Joyce read it, or at least the distilled version of it, at school in Dublin. 
Now, he had a Jesuit education. And that is to say that as well as being steeped in religion, Old and New Testaments, it was also a superb classical and linguistic training. Years later, Joyce would be living in Zurich, and there he befriended an, an English artist by the name of Frank Budgen. And Joyce asked him, who did he think was the complete human being in literary history? Now, what Joyce meant by complete, as in whole, as in three-dimensional, as a sculptor might see the person. Now, Budgen offered some answers, but really Joyce answers his own question. Uh, and there's a quote here. Uh, and what Joyce says, I won't, I, I will butcher the Irish accent as we go along, but I won't do it at this point. Um, Ulysses is son to Laertes, but he's father to Telemachus, husband to Penelope, lover of Calypso, companion in arms of the Greek warriors around Troy and king of Ithaca. He was subjected to many trials, but with wisdom and courage came through them all. Don't forget that he was a war dodger who tried to evade military service by simulating madness. But once the war, uh, but once at the war, the con conscientious objector became a jus caputiste. When the others wanted to abandon the siege, he insisted on staying till Troy should fall, unquote. Um, and that you'll find in, uh, there's a book that I have somewhere here. Here we are, Frank Bargin, James Joyce and the Making of Ulysses. I put little notes in all the lectures uh, so that you'll, uh, you can be able to uh, check the sources. So it's apparent that Joyce uh, was reaching forward as he sometimes saw it from two dimensional Victorian literature. And he contemplated a novel featuring fully rounded, real people observed from all directions. A parallax. Now, this is a word with which Leopold Bloom will grapple in this novel. And what it essentially means, I'm sure many of you already know, is the difference revealed when uh, viewing something from a different perspective, is a sort of basic meaning of that word. And Joyce intended a study of Dublin humanity, but through the prism of this complete human being, the mythical Odysseus of the modern Leopold Bloom. Now, one, not, one ought not to forget, I suppose, that at the time Joyce was writing it, as I say, it was published in 1922, but he, he went through a ter terrible ordeal to get it published. And it was written between 1914 and 1921, with a lot of the earlier chapters at that time, very much against the backdrop of the First World War, which influences it. Um, but also, um, there was feverish excitement that, uh, in late Victorian society and early Edwardian, particularly intellectual society, concerning the discovery of the ruins of ancient Troy. So, we have, we have a sort of background that uh, uh, late Victorian and, 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 and Edwardian sort of intelligentsia were caught up in this classical uh, Greek and Roman sort of stuff. Um, right, I think probably I should take a minute to run through a potted synopsis of the book. So you kind of know roughly where you stand. Now it's been described as a book as having both too much plot and too little plot. Let's go. Here's just a very brief summary. It starts at 8 a.m. on a pleasant summer morning, <coughs> excuse me, in a rather odd fortification tower south of Dublin. It's called a Martello Tower, and several of these were built a century or so earlier in concerned anticipation of French invasion. In there are three men in their 20s. They've spent the night because it's very cheap accommodation. Two are Dubliners, Stephen Dedalus and Malachi Buck Mulligan. And there's an Englishman called Haynes. 
after breakfast thing, they part and arrange to meet in a pub at 12.30. From Stephen's internal thoughts, we know that he resents the other two, in particular, his so-called friend, Buck Mulligan, and he wishes to sleep there no more. He sets off for his place of employment, which is a school in leafy Dorky, a mile or so away. And there he's a part time teacher. And we sit in on the lessons that morning. Um, uh, and we note also that Stephen is dressed in black. Now, he's grieving for his mother, who died a few months earlier. Um, that day, Thursday, 16th June, is a half holiday and so work stops at lunchtime and for Stephen it's also monthly payday which is also significant. We then flash across town to number 7 Eccles Street in northwest of the city and we rewind back to 8am where we started and now we have 38 year old Leopold Bloom and he's made breakfast in bed for his wife, Molly, lucky woman. And in the bedroom, they discuss that later that day, around 4 p.m., Molly will be visited by local theatre impresario, Blazes Boylan, ostensibly to discuss the programme for a touring show the following week, which is to feature the soprano, Molly. Um, but what is left? unsaid but well known to both is that any discussion between Molly and Boylan will take place in the matrimonial bed. Hmm. Now Bloom leaves the house and for our introductory purposes will not return unto the small hours. His day will focus on practicalities uh, for example, he attends the funeral of an acquaintance, therefore he is also dressed in black. Um, and he would also try and earn some money by placing uh, a newspaper advertisement um, for a customer. But really, he's just trying to keep out of the way and somehow uh, mentally coping with the strong expectation that his wife of nearly 20 years is going to be unfaithful that afternoon. Whether this is a regular occurrence or a one-off, we don't know. Or at least we won't know until the very end of the book. We shall learn that Bloom will struggle though to maintain the moral high ground because he will conduct a clandestine affair of his own albeit uh, only via correspondence. And he'll harbour lustful thoughts for other women. Molly and Bloom, it, it transpires, have not had full sexual intercourse since the death of their son, uh, Rudy, who lived only uh, 11 days. And that provides some context to Molly's infidelity and Bloom's Rawdy reverie. They have a daughter, Millie, aged 15, who has recently moved away to take a job, and this adds to her father's angst. As the story unfolds, we gradually sense that Stephen and Bloom have some sort of connection, but are only peripherally aware of each other's existence, and they don't meet until around 10.30 that night at a maternity hospital. Neither has, has any obvious reason to be there, so it's somewhat serendipitous that that is where they meet. Meanwhile, we follow them separately around Dublin, more bloom than Stephen, which is a blessing, because Stephen, like his alter ego, the young James Joyce, has a deep brooding nature with a tendency to over-intellectualize and to condescend. Whereas Bloom, in spite of, or maybe because of, his personal peccadilloes and fallibilities, of which there are many, is more in chime with the normal reader. Bloom episodes 
are a lot easier than Stephen episodes. Anyway, day gives way to night and Bloom develops paternal feelings for Stephen. He's aware of Stephen's mother's recent death and that his boozy father seems intent on uh, driving the family to the poorhouse. Beyond midnight, uh, Bloom follows the by now very drunk Stephen to the red light uh, district. And when Stephen gets into a fight, Bloom rescues him from prosecution. They return to Bloom's house for a cup of cocoa before Stephen departs. In the final episode, Molly from her bedroom and um, while Bloom is asleep next to her, gives her version of events. And that's it. We're not dealing here with drama on an epic scale or anything close, but put a microscope to ordinary life and properly observed, we have drama, we have pathos and comedy nonetheless. We may say we have the inspiration for the soap opera. Right, next section, number three, a word on structure, style and content. Taking its cue from Homer, the book splits into three parts. The first three episodes constitute the telema, telema, Telemachiad. Now, in the Odyssey, this is where Telemachus sets out to find his father, and in Ulysses, these centre on Stephen Dedalus. The next 12 episodes are the wanderings of Ulysses, in which we observe Bloom's various trips around Dublin. And this is the heart and great bulk of the story. The final uh, three episodes correspond to the homecoming or Nostus in the Odyssey and depict Stephen and Bloom returning from Night Town uh, for, a, for that cup of cocoa at Bloom's house. The book could end there, but thank goodness it doesn't, for in the final episode, uh, Penelope, we have the inner thoughts of Molly Bloom as she lies in bed with her sleeping husband, and which is a tour de force of world literature. It's a book of many styles, and after initial orthodoxy, um, style sort of fluctuates per episode. But the narrator, sometimes reliable, often not, is generally in charge. Now, more of a technique uh, is the use of uh, the monologue interior, stream of consciousness, the inner thoughts of a character set out on the page. Joyce is far from unique in its use, even and even then. He certainly wasn't the first to introduce it. And now we're quite used to uh, this way of uh, uh, novels sort of panning out. But what makes him so difficult, even now, is that he hops from narrative to dialogue to monologue interior and back mid-sentence, interchanging characters, interchanging language. Sometimes the person talking or thinking, I say a person, may be an inanimate object. And all of this without a buy your leave to the reader. There aren't really quotation marks. There aren't, there, there's, there's punctuation is, is, you know, Joyce sort of makes that up as he goes along. Uh, and so it's, it could be quite hard to make sense of it. So I, I take here a cue from uh, Nabokov's uh, book, Lectures on Literature, to look at an, an early example of this monologue interior. And it's right back at the beginning of the book, back up on that roof of the Martello Tower, where Butt Mulligan is shaving. And he's talking to, or rather at, Stephen in the typically mocking and crude manner, which we'll come to expect of the buck. They both look out over Dublin Bay. Pertinent background here is that Stephen was bedside when his mother died a few months earlier. And, uh, as, as a devout Catholic, she asks him 
to pray for the redemption of her soul. But Stephen, following Joyce in vaguely comparable circumstances in 1903, has renounced religion and does not. Mulligan, having snatched Stephen's handkerchief to clean his razor, makes crude remarks about the dirty nose rag. He looks out over circular Dublin Bay. He calls it the snot green sea, the scrotum tightening sea. And he recalls how the poet Algernon Swinburne described the sea as the grey sweet mother. He admonishes Stephen, why could he not have just done the decent thing and prayed for his mum like a normal person? We probably have some sympathy with that. All this feeds into Stephen's thought. The circular bay, the snot green sea, the sweet mother. And in his head, he's back at her deathbed. The ring of the bay and the skyline encircling the snot green sea reminds him of the ceramic bowl at her bedside into which she vomited the green bile wretched from her rotten, rotting kidneys. The sweet mother resonates the bitter memory of his or her bitter tears. Now, all of that is going on in his head in a millisecond as the conversation sort of ping pongs between them. And it, it also serves to contrast the characters. But Mulligan, for whom life is generally a crude joke, and Stephen, for whom trivia is very serious business. So we can only imagine how the death of his mother and his own part in that must be torturing him. Turning from style to content, like Forrest Gump's box of chocolates, there's something for everyone. So broad is Joyce's grasp, really. No matter the background, any particular reader might, I would say, will appreciate nuances that the greatest scholars miss. If you know Dublin, even after a hundred years, you have an advantage in being able to better visualize what the rest of us can only imagine. If you were raised Catholic or Jewish, if you know Irish history or Latin or the classics, if you've studied philosophy, Shakespeare, if you understand the workings of the pub industry or the newspaper industry, or if you're musical, etc., etc., etc. Any of those and more, many more, will reveal nuggets, little nuggets in there that sail over other heads, even very clever. Now, before getting into our three main characters, which will sort of conclude this introductory lecture, I'd like to discuss some themes or undercurrents that sort of run throughout. Now, there's many of these, many, myriad. Uh, compassion, Irish nationalism, racism, animal rights, many, many more, dozens of but I'm going to highlight two now so that I can drill down into them in a little more detail. Now, the first one, and I, I should apologize, but then I should make no apology for it. It's part of the fun of the book. The first theme is pretty wacky and esoteric and a little difficult, um, but hang on in there because the second one is, is on much steadier ground. Now, I'm gonna call the first theme Souls in Time and Space. Now, this is a book about time. Whilst uncertainty might abound in all sorts of other ways, we do tend to know the time of the day. Yet time concertinas. At one point, Stephen has a real or imagined shift to medieval Dublin. Whereas 
in the crazy, magical, and very funny episode, Circe, Bloom experiences visionary sequences running for several pages, but in real time last a millisecond. We first meet the Blooms in episode four, and Molly, reading in bed, asks Bloom the meaning of a word that she's read in her novel. And I apologize here for, as I say, butchering the Irish accent in, with my East London Ilford drawl. Met him what? He asked. Here, she said. What does this mean? Met him psychosis. Yes, who's he when he's at home? Uh, met him psychosis, he said, frowning. Uh, it's Greek, uh, from, from the Greek. Uh, it, it means uh, uh, the transmigration of souls. Oh, rocks, she said. Tell us in plain words. Unquote. We may be more familiar with the word reincarnation, that our souls transport across the ages, residing a while in various receptacles. And the question is asked in episode 14, what is the age of the soul of man? Odysseus and Bloom may be separated by thousands of years and are superficially at least so different, but nevertheless, as the story unfolds, we wonder, are their souls connected? And that if time might, uh, between them, might uh, evaporate. Now, intertwined in this is the notion that history is a constant cycle of repetition. I'll mention sort of in passing uh, a, a, a philosopher, Jean-Baptiste Vico. He was born 1668 in Naples. And not only did he consider there to be nothing new under the sun, but that the repeating historical cycles beat to a certain rhythm. Tapping through aristocracy, sorry, through autocracy, aristocracy, democracy, chaos, before some great convulsion or thunderclap, say a pandemic, for instance, resets the circuits and the pattern begins. It restarts. Stephen, in typically offhand way, uh, says in episode uh, two that uh, history is a nightmare from which I'm trying to awake. Now, let's remember that Joyce wrote Ulysses living in Italy, France and Switzerland, and for a large part during World War I, the pointless loss of life repeating the pattern of so many previous wars. And as per those other wars, it was the young and the poor that bore the brunt. The pacifism of Bloom, notably in Cyclops and, uh, and Circe episodes, echoes that of Odysseus from time long gone. So we have souls marching across time. How about if they also move across space? And here I mention a word, consubstantiation. And for those of you that may not know, this is the idea that the three hypostatic pillars of Christianity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, might, in a sense, be notionally separate, but in another are one and the same. And for the greater part of the last 2,000 years, Challenges to that were deemed heretics, which likely meant uh, excommunication at best and often a swift passage to the afterlife. Now, this introduces the father and son relationship, um, which is a theme that will develop throughout. And look out for Stephen's circle, uh, the son, and Bloom's circle, the father, orbiting and eventually partially uh, eclipsing in a sort of uh, mystical intergalactic Venn diagram of the soul. The autobiographical Joyce starts out quite obviously Stephen, the Joyce of that age, 22. But by the end, maybe he's more than a little Bloom. Anyway, at one point, Bloom, to give sort of 
uh, linked to some of this. Um, Bloom passes along the sunny side of the street and ruminates on the headpiece, which is a, or a logo of a newspaper, the Freeman's Journal. It was probably the most popular newspaper in 1904, in real, a real, real newspaper. And it supported uh, the whole Home Rule Party um, uh, and Home Rule for Ireland, or sort of did at that time. Uh, and its headpiece showed the sun rising over the Bank of Ireland. And it looked very nice, very natty little uh, logo. Uh, but that means that the sun rises in the northwest. And this obviously can never happen because the sun rises in the east. Um, uh, and so Bloom wonders, well, has this put the mockers on home rule ever occurring? Because it's never going to happen. Yet, allowing for the pun of the sun, like the planet, the sun, and the sun, the child, the sun will rise in the northwest because Stephen Dedalus, actual son of Simon and arguably surrogate son of Bloom, will rise that night from Bloom's house in northwest Dublin. And the same might be said, incidentally, of Bloom if he can be seen as a spiritual successor to Parnell. And we'll, we'll get into that. Now, Bloom, of course, he's blissfully unaware of such machinations of the gods as he meanders down the street. And we sense this, uh, that, that in this book, minor acts of seeming in consequence, somehow have galactic reverberations and vice versa. Okay, that is enough time, space, and intergalactics. You'll be relieved to know that the second uh, theme, and incidentally, I would say that this lecture will last about 45 minutes, so we're probably, we're, we're, we're edging towards the, uh, the close. Um, uh, but our second theme I'd like to talk about is much more normal and readily understood. And it's usurpation, to usurp something. At the end of our book, it's signed off. Trieste, Zurich, Paris, 1914 to 1921. So, the book that has come to embody Dublin and perhaps the Irish more than any other, was written in voluntary exile. Joyce left Ireland in 1904, and he died in 1941 in Zurich without having meaningfully returned beyond the odd uh, brief sojourn. And he felt usurped both from his land and his people, yet somehow collectively with his people. Uh, particularly Joyce, the young creative artist, um, he perceived the collective suffering of the Irish and, and especially the working class, just as Telemachus and Penelope felt usurped from their home and Hamlet, which is a constant undercurrent, uh, felt his birthright denied. So by the end of A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, Stephen Dedalus, the young Joyceably Dedalus personae are at this point one and the same, um, which you know, may be a risky statement for me to make, but there we are, I'm saying it at this point, Joyce, 22 year old Joyce and, and 22 year old Stephen Dedalus are the same. Um, by this point, he is desperate to flee Ireland by the end of the, of the last novel. He bemoans that every soul born in Ireland is caught up in nets, and it's the very act of that hemming in that is the push to leave. Yet once Joyce, who does leave, as I say, 1904, once he's geographically free, he spends the rest of his life thinking and writing about Dublin. Can't live with her, can't live without her, expresses the conflicted love-hate sentiment many Dubliners had for their city and country at that time. Or as the newspaper headline in episode seven, Aeolus puts it, Dear Dirty Dublin. 
Now, I'd like to consider what I think might be four of those nets. Firstly, imperialism. 1904 Dublin, the second city of the British Isles and a significant, if provincial, trading uh, post in the empire, but it was ruled by London. The Viceroy's residence was in Phoenix Park. The civil service was centered in Dublin Castle and various military barracks throughout the city underlined who was in charge. And not everyone was against this. The spectrum of opinion uh, ranged from not insignificant support for the British through the vast majority of generally ambivalent, but if pressed, definitely favoured some form of home rule, through to uh, very nationalist and then armed resistance to the British. That's the first net. The second net, um, as Joyce saw it and Stephen saw it, was the rigid constraints of the Catholic Church. And it had over 80% of uh, either the Irish population or the Dublin population in tow, but certainly in both cases, uh, uh, an overwhelming percentage of the population was Catholic and religious. And as Stephen explains in episode one to the Englishman Haynes, he has two masters, one British, one Italian. And the ineffectiveness and stagnating effect of both Britain and Vatican, Caesar and Christ, is beautifully demonstrated in the Wandering Rocks episode. The third net, the acquiescence of the Irish middle class. Some Catholic, such as Buck Mulligan, but mostly Protestant, economically vested in the status quo and like the church, had no desire for change. I'll leave that there. But let's get to the last net. This is quite interesting. The lower middle and working classes in Dublin, overwhelmingly Catholic, and I think these have the most interesting net. One that Joyce Sublique Stephen considered to be sucking out the life and retarding the progress of his people. And he called it sentimentality, stoked on the one flank by romantic poets led by W.B. Yeats and more generally the Irish literary revival, and on the other hand, by nationalist republicanism. There was a harking back to a mythical golden age of the Irish over the Celtic rainbow and into the mists of time, the sons and daughters of Erin were a plucky warrior nation of passion and poetry. Whereas, and forgive the generalization, um, for what do I know, uh, but the reality Stephen saw, starting with his father around his own table, were men that gambled and drunk away the weekly wage, often leaving women to keep body, soul, and countless children and the family home intact. This sentimentality, as Joyce saw it, soaked in booze, led to a general inertia and an inability, in particular among the working class, to deal with the very real problems that they faced. In episode three, we'll look out for the empty bottle of stout stogged to its waist in the sand. Blue, meanwhile, talking of usurpation, is being supplanted by another man in his own bed. How's that for usurpation? And what does he do? He goes out. No one has driven him from his home. He goes willingly. He keeps out of the way and allows it to happen. What kind of a latter-day hero is he? What would Odysseus or Siegfried or Kukulain have done? Does he not want to fight for his marriage? Oh, he does. Desperately, in fact. That he does not may speak to cowardice 
or subtlety of tactics, or that he gets a bit of a masochistic thrill from the cuckolding. There's some truth in that. Whatever the reason, he resigns himself to what will be, will be. And he seems to think that what is the point in fighting the inevitable? He rationalizes it in his mind and takes comfort that in the long run, he's her husband and Molly, he hopes, will come around. So those, those are the two themes that I wanted to deal with. Uh, this transmigration of souls and uh, usurpation. Right, now the final part of this introductory lecture is a few words on the three protagonists, Stephen, Bloom and Molly. I've already talked quite a bit about uh, Stephen and Bloom, but I'm gonna embellish that uh, a little. We know Stephen Dedalus to be very, very clever, but not as clever as he thinks he is. A brooding poet, a budding bohemian, having just spent three months in Paris where he was scraping around for every centime. Back home, it's every penny. He thought he was gone for good. He thought he'd escaped, he'd flown the nets but his mother's terminal illness drew him back. His Hamlet persona is genuine and it suits his personality, but it also suits the mysterious intellectual persona that he wishes to cultivate. His borrowed and frayed black hand-me-downs reflect not only his grieving and his poverty, but also this uh, aspirational aura of the artist pained by the universe. He has relinquished religion, but once took it so seriously as to have contemplated holy orders. And he retains respect and reverence for certain Jesuit priests and educators. His renouncement of the clergy was in no uh, small part due to his uh, heartfelt resignation that he would learn life's lessons as a sinner. So here I quote from uh, a portrait of the artist. Quote, the snares of the world were its ways of sin. He would fall. He had not yet fallen, but he would fall silently in an instant. Not to fall was too hard, too hard. And he felt the silent lapse of his soul as it would be at some instants to come, falling, falling, but not yet fallen, still unfallen, but about to fall." Unquote. Going by his name, he did fall. Douglas. What an odd name for an Irishman. Now it's after Daedalus the great inventor of ancient Greece, the artificer, the creator of the great maze of Crete and of waxen wings so that he and his son Icarus could escape. But Icarus flies too close to the sun, as we know, the, the, mat, the, the wax melts and he crashed to a watery death. I'm not sure why he flies too high. Was he trying to outdo his father or simply to strive for the sake of striving? We shall think about this. Look out for Stephen's various allusions to flying, fear of water and drowning. And look out too for the portrayal of Simon Dedalus, Stephen's literary father and the conflation with Dedalus. Quote, as the great artificer whose name he bore. If Stephen is prone to falling, it might be due to his difficulty in seeing where he's going. His myopia is terrible. And we learn late in the book that he has broken his glasses, reminding us of the Father Dolan injustice in a portrait. Our second protagonist 
is Leopold Bloom. What a joy. Bloom blooms. If Stephen is the inner world, Bloom is the outer. His lot in life is sort of fair to middling. At a superficial level, he's okay. He's sufficiently above the poverty line. He knows where his next meal's coming from, uh, and he's even got some savings. That puts him comfortably above many of uh, his associates that we shall meet, largely because his life does not revolve around the pub. Uh, but he suffered some of the hardest knocks that life can throw. The marriage is complex and his wife plays around, though no, maybe not as much as Bloom fears. Although he's not technically Jewish, he is at best treated as an outsider by most people, at best, and at worst, the victim of regular and horrible racial slurs, both to his face and more often behind his back. His father committed suicide some 18 years earlier, and Rudy, his only son, died 11 years ago, aged just 11 days. Yet, Bloom somehow remains optimistic and life affirming. He has, he has a lovely uh, daughter, Millie, and despite all, he adores his wife. He enjoys his food and in moderation, wine, cider, and an occasional uh, cigar. If not dapper man about town, he's comfortable in his body. He likes to read and he has an inquiring mind. He also likes to help people, not because he thinks it's the right thing to do, rather it's the natural thing to do. Contrast with Stephen. One, a Jesuit educated Catholic from generations of Irish, yet feels the outsider. The other, entitled to feel an outsider in every respect, is ignoring some lapses, sanguine and kind of pretty much at home. Don't get me wrong, Bloom has several neuroses, but whereas Stephen allows his to pervade, Bloom rationalizes. For Bloom is a rational man, a graduate of the University of Life. Let's take renunciation of faith. Like Stephen and Catholicism, Bloom has renounced Judaism. Or more accurately, he carries the guilt of his father having done so, who, like many immigrant Jews in the mid 19th century, uh, converted to Christianity either for marriage or in order to earn a living. Now, Bloom the son compounds this by being baptized both for both the Protestants and Catholics. And it's a similar guilt, yet somehow it weighs so much heavier with Stephen. Time spent in Stephen's head descends so far down dark holes, we wonder if he and we will cope. Time spent inside Bloom's head also reveals a thinker, but at a far more practical level. We may be a little shocked at the full gamut of his peccadilloes, but at the same time, we're assured. Bloom will be all right. Because of Bloom, we feel Stephen will be all right. And because of Bloom, somehow we'll all be all right. Now, tempting though it is to leave Bloom on such a note, I can't help but fear I've grossly simplified such a complex three-dimensional character who, like Odysseus, is indeed a man of many turns. Now let's come eventually to Marion, Molly Bloom. Of the many people that try to read this book, a considerable proportion turn to the very last episode and read 
Molly's soliloquy. If we dare to place it in time and place, sorry, in time and space, it's about three in the morning. She's lying in bed with her sleeping husband's feet in her face because the weirdo can't sleep top to toe. His face is in her buttocks. A person can't even fart in bed, she laments, while she reflects on her day, her marriage and her life. By this time in the book, we've heard loads about her. She may already be judged, but now that judgment is held to account in a full-blooded, ribald stream of thought that runs some 50 pages, almost without pausing for breath. Molly is parallaxed. In other words, when considered from a different perspective, now her own, she's seen anew. She expects no favours, nor does she intend to dish them out. A free spirit in both a patriarchal world and an inadequate marriage. She gets on with life. Bloom drives her mad, and in several respects, we sympathise with her, as to much of it. She relives in lurid detail the, um, the afternoon spent with her lover, Blazes Boylan. And much of that is what really got the book into trouble back in the 20s. Anyway. She aches for Monday when Boylan has promised to return. And then for the week after that, with their touring ensemble, which seems to, which seems likely to star Molly in every respect, it will tour Belfast and then maybe Liverpool. She doesn't know how she's going to get through the three days until Boylan's return longing again to be serviced by that tremendous great brute of a thing she, he has. Unquote. However, as her thoughts spin out, something unexpected percolates almost unnoticed until it's upon us. And it's an undeniable fondness for bloom infuriating bloom. Finally, her thoughts turn to that afternoon on Hoth Head many years before, where she and Bloom first made love. And this echoes Bloom's own recollection earlier that day of the same scene. When he recollects it, he's alone in a cafe, watching two flies on the window stuck amid drying paint. We don't know how the 17th of June and beyond will pan out. But despite the water that has flown under so many bridges since that sunny afternoon atop Hoth Head, they both recall that time with such fondness that, yes, let's be optimistic. So those are the main actors in our play. There are, of course, many others including Dublin itself. The book teems with life, mainly from the drinking, lower middle and working classes, but also the intelligentsia as befits Stephen Dedalus. The bad guys, the obvious usurpers, Buck Mulligan and Blazes Boylan, light up the pages when they appear. The Buck gets most of the best lines as bad guys tend to. Boylan is denied that and much else by way of serious character development. Joyce bestows upon him a total of three words of interior monologue. And he generally stews in the juices of his two-dimensional nastiness. I dare not offer any conclusions, for we are at the start of our journey. Uh, and in a book of journeys, the task of reading Ulysses is another. Perhaps not of epic struggle, but you will know you've been in a fight. There's no roadmap, 
But that's the fun of the best journeys. How boring to have every turn and undulation clearly signposted uh, kilometers in advance. I lower the flag and declare this journey underway. Thank you.